All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby back again with Big Game James. We are running back episode two of Positively Relentless. Got some more Mavs talk. Got some more Cowboys talk. Some stuff has happened. We've had the first game of the second round and an NFL draft. So, yeah, some good stuff to dig into. First and foremost, James, how are you doing, my dude? I'm doing well, man. You know, um, not too well. I mean, the Mavericks lost, but, you know, we felt good that we at least we finally got past that round uh, that we have been talking about forever. Uh, but um, unfortunately, took that L against Phoenix, and we're going to see what happens um, today. Uh, got a must-win game, uh, but once again, at least got excited, finally got past that first round that I had been waiting for for uh seemed like eons uh so hopefully they can take that next step and the cowboys draft um a little bit excited about that uh because uh looked like they helped themselves and we'll see what happens so ready to talk about both those uh teams right now oh for sure i mean it was a it was a really interesting it was an interesting matchup uh for the mavericks but i kind of knew going in phoenix was going to be heavily favored. I know a lot of people picked Utah in the first round as well. In fact, I think every expert picked against Dallas, but I think that's more uh, an indictment of what Dallas has been the last 10 years. Like you said, they, it took them 11 years to get out of the first round again. So it had been a minute and the Suns are far and away. I think the best team this year, maybe a couple other teams can sneak up on them, but the Suns were pretty much there for the entirety of the year. I think they started a little shaky through the first 10 or 15 games. And then they pretty much snapped to it and we're good. So yeah, Mavericks down 01 play game two tonight. In fact, they'll be tipping off here in just a few minutes as we record this now. So we'll be multitasking, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting challenge. Obviously what game one showed us was Luca can go get his buckets whenever he wants 45, 12 and eight on 50% shooting. But what we kind of thought might happen is what happened. (laughs) They pretty much said, all right, yeah, Luca, you're going to go do you. We get that, but we're going to take away your next best guy. Last year was the same thing. If, if KP was the number two Clippers just said, all right, KP is not doing Jack. We're not going to let him do anything. And Brunson who averaged, 27.8 27.8 points in the first round didn't do anything last night and we'll we'll get into that a little bit more but yeah it was it was pretty much Luca versus the world again and th- the fact that you had a game like that and lost by seven on the road I guess is kind of encouraging but at the same time you you got to get help you got to get Luca help. It's not going to be enough if your bench is going to give you. Now you got 19 off the bench from Maxi. Maxi had a good game, but you're not going to be able to to hold up if you don't get a number two or a number three guy stepping up as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, like we said, like you just basically said about um, Jalen Brunson, he was like the star of the first round. Uh, he was the darling of the first round. He felt good as we were going into this round against Phoenix, uh, but once again. Phoenix Suns were one of the top teams in the West consistently, as you said, from the very beginning to the very beginning season until now. Um, they had they had uh, Devin Booker. He was out with the hamstring. He came back strong, and uh, he's a I mean he's all around player, and he plays good defense as well. And I think you had mentioned it earlier when we were talking about even when we were uh, kind of chatting back and forth. The length is a lot different um, with yeah. the Phoenix Suns than the Utah Jazz. And they play defense. I mean, I don't feel like the Utah Jazz are really a defensive-oriented team. Um, and, I mean, you had Donovan Mitchell, those type of guys. I just don't feel like they were defensive stalwarts. worse. We have guys right here, uh, Cameron Johnson, Jay Crowder, Devin Booker, you know, Michael Bridges, uh, those Cameron Payne, those type of guys are, have good lengthy. Uh, but you still had Je- JaVel McGee and DeAndre Ayton. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of those are s- legit seven footers and you see McGee, he can, he can play, you know, with the small guys, you know what I'm saying? He's not just a, a one of those big man type difference where he can't move around. So I think he presents more of a challenge than you had a, like a Ru- Rudy Gobert. I felt like he's more of a statue where you have more fluidity with Deandre Ayton and JaVel McGee. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a different defensive dynamic that the Phoenix Suns are coming at you with. Um, and so I think it just really uh, affected Jalen Brunson because we know 
I think he only shot like one point, one three pointer. Yep. We know his game is kind of like an inside type game. He likes to get to the hole. He likes to, you know, do his little pump fakes. He likes to get in there. But with this type of length, you could see it really affected him. He couldn't really get off his shot the way he wanted. Oh, 100 percent. And I mean, yeah, you, you mentioned the difference in the front court here versus Utah. Yeah, Gobert is a great defender, a phenomenal defender, but he was the only defender on that team. And that allowed Brunson to use his craftiness to absolute maximum potential because he could get to the lane at will. And then all he had to do is almost like coasting into the paint. And then he just kind of had to wait until that moment to use whatever shifty moves uh, he could throw at Gobert to create that space for him to get those little fall away shots and all of that brilliant stuff. But against Utah or sorry, against Phoenix, you're not going to have that free lane to get to. And the, the front court of the Suns is way more on the other end uh, offensively adept than Gobert by a mile. Like you mentioned Aiton specifically. Yeah. Aiton's going to stretch you out. You, you, might not have to worry about anything from Gobert offensively other than like alley oops or something or put back layups, but you're not going to have to worry uh, about that at all with, with Phoenix because Aiden will stretch you out to the three point line. He'll, he'll kill you. I mean, he's, it's kind of amazing how I don't think they blew it by not taking Luca number one, but it's kind of amazing that they very clearly missed. I think the best player in the draft And they suffered no real consequences for it. You know what I mean? Like they kind of like, it's almost like they rallied well enough with their subsequent moves. And then obviously the, the Chris Paul trade is what put them over the top, but it's, it's really impressive what they've been able to build because they are a damn good team. Uh, The, the length, the athleticism, their offensive game is great. Here's the thing in game one, you mentioned Booker coming back from the hamstring. He was only seven of 20. I mean, he, he wasn't phenomenal. We've had games where Booker has murdered us in the past. So that's almost a little concerning for me. Is like, it feels like, oh, you only got 23 out of Booker and you weren't able to overcome that. And you don't like wasting a good maxi game because like you saw in the first round, you might get a couple of those and then they kind of go away. You need to take advantage if they're there. And he gave you 19 points, five threes off the bench. You hate to waste that, but... You don't really have much of a choice when Jalen Brunson is six of 16 and Dinwiddie is another, I mean, Dinwiddie, he, he's kind of regressed a little bit. Like he had a couple standout moments, maybe one complete standout game in the first round, but his performances have largely been kind of reminiscent of his stint in Washington, like very forgettable, underwhelming, inefficient stuff. So I I don't know. They, they got to make some adjustments for sure. Yeah, they definitely have to make some adjustments for sure. But I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I noticed in that game, uh, the rebounding margin um, in that game, uh, you know, Dallas has always had kind of a little bit of an issue with the rebounding because they don't really have a consistent, like, dominant kind of big man type that's going to get you, like, 10, 12 rebounds every single game. Mm -hmm. We know what Powell and Maxi with the combination and even Luca gets in there. (laughs) I mean, you know what I mean? But uh, one thing was just alarming to me. I think like Cameron Johnson, Crowder, uh, Chris Paul, uh, Aiton, Booker, Michael Bridges all had over at least five rebounds a game. Yep. I mean, a uh, five in, rebounds in, in the game. game. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was very alarming to me. And that can't happen because if they're going to continue to get beat up on the boards like that, uh, it was what, 57 to 36, I believe. 51, um, 51, 51, 36. 51, yeah. 36. Sorry. And 13 um, to seven on the offensive glass. That's not going to work, and that's not going to win. And just like you said, uh, just with uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, once again, play 30 minutes, 3 of 8, 37% from the field. I mean, he's got to do better. He's one of the reasons why when they made that trade, he was like a piece that we were looking to, to -hmm. be that consistent piece, to be kind of like, not like the third piece, but uh, we know what Dinwiddie can bring to the table as far as he can play multiple positions for you. But he's got to play better because if he doesn't play better, it's going to be a long, long series for the Mavericks here against Phoenix. Or it's going to be a very short one. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So uh, giving further context, and I have this stat up on the screen, for the compact uh, con, what's the word? I just just literally said it and then I like context. context. Yes. I said complex. I meant context (laughs) to the the rebounding thing you just mentioned. The Mavericks uh, front court, Maxi and Powell played 42 combined minutes. Do you know how many rebounds they had between them? 
You said between who? Maxi and Dwight Powell. Uh, yeah, I actually do. Let me see. They had, oh, wow. Two boards. Two boards. <laughs> two 42 rebounds. 42 minutes. Wow. Two boards. Meanwhile, you mentioned it as well. Every Sun starter had at least five rebounds, and that was Chris Paul. And Chris Paul's not six foot. <laughs> right. They might, they might tell you he's six one or something. He he's he's not. He's like five ten. Right. But uh, yeah, that is brutal. Now again, Maxi gave you nineteen points, but I really kind of get the feeling this is going to be one of those series where uh, Dwight Powell. Pro- I mean, he was borderline unplayable in the first round. And I think it's going to be that like in a playoff series, I don't know that Dwight Powell is, he, he might be a regular season more. He had a great year this year uh, coming back off the Achilles and everything, but in the playoffs for a starting center, I, I don't think that's it. I just think that they've been kind of stuck the past couple of years with that situation. Rick has uh, an, infa- an infatuation with him and they just didn't have time to make something happen, especially after the KP thing fell apart this year. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're, you're in a situation now where it's like, you're getting nothing in the rebounding department. You could get out rebounded big by the jazz in the first round. That was the calculated risk they took and it worked getting out rebounded, giving up the points in the paint. They were able to overcome that. The problem is this is a better team. And, you know, and not only that specifically, they're a better defensive team. So that trade-off worked when the other team couldn't really stop you. This team is very capable of stopping you. And so you playing that incredibly dangerous game on the boards and points in the paint, it's probably not going to cut it here. I think Dallas is probably going to have to lean its small ball lineup again, which is again, dangerous. But at this point, I don't know what you have to lose. Like you, you during the, during game six against Utah, Dallas in the third quarter with like nine minutes, 40 seconds left in the third quarter was down 12. They went small with Luca Brunson and did on the floor over the next three minutes, 47 seconds, they went a combined six of six from the field and erased the deficit to two. Like you have three creators, three guys that can go get their own shot. And Dallas playing small has been very effective this year, uh, especially since that trade. So maybe you do take your chances and consider occasionally throwing a small ball lineup with Dorian Finney-Smith guarding Aiton. I'm not saying it's ideal, but I don't know how much worse it could be in terms of rebounding and you're getting something at least in the trade-off offensively, spreading the floor better, making things easier for Dinwiddie and Brunson who need that space because they both want to get to the basket. That's their first instinct, both of them, is to get to the basket. And Dinwiddie's pressing and he's not finding anything, but that doesn't really stop him from trying. So you might as well, I think go small, live with the pain and like on the other end and just try to say, all right, let's just get our offense as efficient as we can and hope that our three guys can cobble together more than, you know, than Phoenix is able to put together. Yep. Uh, as we were just talking, you know, the getting ready to tip off, kind of looking like to the left and to the right as you're talking. Uh, but number one, they're talking about and they got the eye and the bullseye on Dinwiddie. You just talked about it. Uh, but we also got to get something from the Josh Green. He had a little bit. I mean, he, he had a little bit of his way in that Utah series. I mean, yeah, I know he's not somebody you're looking at, but 10 minutes, nothing, no points. Um, we just had something out of Keebler. This got to be a game where. Bullock, Brunson, Smith, <laughs> yeah, called to all arms. These guys have to play really ridiculous today um, and tonight to really get this uh, thing uh, going. But we really have to hit these boards tonight. Luca had 12 rebounds in that game. He had 10 mm-hmm. defensive rebounds. We got to have more than that. And like you said, you can't have Max Keebler and Dwight Powell having two rebounds between the both of them playing over 40 minutes uh, between both of them. That's just not going to work. And uh, Dwight Powell, he's got to be better. I didn't, I thought, you know, he wasn't ter- I mean, I know what you said about Utah, uh, but, you know, I was feeling good about Powell the way he, you know, his athleticism has shown um, mm-hmm. coming back from that injury. Uh, but we need him in a big way, especially rebounding today. He got to get some rebounds today. You got to. You're listening to me today, Dwight. You got to get some rebounds today, big dog, please. He's got to he's got to find a way to make an impact for sure. Uh, and as we talk here, Dallas is down seven zero to start this game. So yeah. 
good. That's good what killed there. us last time. Yeah. Yeah. So good start there. Yeah. They're, they're going to have to figure some stuff out for sure. Cause the, the first game, yeah. Luca versus the world wasn't going to do it. Brunson 27.6 points, points. Let me, we'll just roll this into our next topic here. Uh, Brunson. I think Brunson is ultimately what will decide if the Mavericks can actually win this series again, because it has been Luca versus the world. They're going to have to find that next guy and Brunson in the first round, 27.8 points per game on 48.4% shooting and 36.4% from three phenomenal. Like you said, you said it yourself earlier. He was like the darling of the playoffs in the first round because everybody around the league was like, holy crap who's this guy wait he's a free agent this summer like not even restricted <laughs> like everybody's ears perked up but now we have uh, a return to that prompt and that question that i have said has loomed for more than a year with brunson and it's now going to be tested to its fullest can he still be effective when he's dealing with long athletic defenders like that basically helped play him off the floor in the first round last year games four through seven he barely got out there at all like he was an afterthought now carlisle didn't ever give him the leash that kid has this year but it it limited him and it made it tough so for him to come out in game one and drop only 13 points to, to give some context Brunson before that utah series had never had three straight games in his career scoring at least 20 points he had 20 plus points in every single game in that Utah series. He came out in game one, 13 on, what did I say? Five of like 16 shooting, something like that. Mm -hmm. A a sharp drop off here. So yeah, there's, there's valid reason for concern. Dallas's ability to, to upset Phoenix or make any kind of run is going to hinge entirely on Brunson because Dinwiddie's going to be hit or miss, but he's he's kind of your what's the phrase there? Not vol- I guess volume shooter is appropriate. Your streaky scorer off the bench is how I think of Dinwiddie. Brunson's got to be that next rock next to Luca. He's got to be that rock, and he's got to be it right now. But right now there ain't no rocks. Uh, they finally get on the board. I think mm-hmm. Luca just hit one. Yep. Uh, but as we said before. Brunson, he's got to do better. Um, And just like you said, he's got to be able to get past this length. He's got to be able to hit some threes. That's going to be big for him. Um, He was like, what, 0 for 1 for three-point range. Um, He's got to be able to hit some threes, and he's got to be able to get to that free throw line as well. He only had one attempt at the free throw line. His game is kind of getting to the hole, so he's got to kind of create that contact, get that to the hole. 6 of 16 is not going to work. We need a huge game from him today, so hopefully he can bounce back and uh, show what he's kind of made of and show what he showed in Utah, and it's got a spark right now. Yeah, it's 11 to 2. Uh, and Devin Booker just got an and one on a pull-up jumper on two Mavericks. So that's how they're starting. Mm. Uh, 847 left in the first quarter. So we're about three minutes and change in, and it's not uh, not good so far. We'll see how they can respond. But yeah, this is, this is a tough matchup because one of Phoenix's best strengths, the front court, is kind of Dallas's like glaring Achilles heel. Mm. And so far, it doesn't look like Dallas is doing a whole lot to try and change up how they're going to counteract that. And uh, some of these guys, they're just going to have to hit shots. And right on cue, there's a block with the three. So good job there. But uh, you mentioned like Josh Green earlier. Josh Green in game one, he looked afraid at times to take a three. Like Luca mm-hmm. was kicking to him and he didn't mm-hmm. seem like he wanted it. And I'm just like, right. I know you didn't get any favors done for you last year, not getting right. enough playing time, but right. you cannot in the playoffs turn down wide open shots. You mm-hmm. can't, especially when the defense is like daring you. Right. And that's that's just kind of the case here. Luca's going to find these guys and create these looks, but they have to actually be able to step in and knock them down, which there's Bullock again. So a couple quick baskets from him. There you go. But uh, yeah. that's that's a good veteran stepping up there for them. So, yeah, I like Bullock's game. He always plays hard. 
mean, mm-hmm. he always seems to come uh, to the, you know, every single game he seems and, you know, he brings it every single game. That's what I love about him. He's real kind of scrappy. Uh, and I mean, if you look at Finley, Finney Smith, they're, they're kind of t- the same to me as far as their scrappiness. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, big, big time, like I said, hitting a couple big back to back J's, the three and then the pull up J. Uh, but like I said, we got to have play a lot of better defense as well. Um, you know, DeAndre Ayton, um, he, we got to figure out what we're going to do with him because, like you said, he, he was 12 of 22. I'm excuse me, 12 of 20 the last game. Uh, but he is a different presence than a uh, Rudy Gobert. Remember, yeah. we talked about Rudy Gobert. He was just more like your rebounder, your block shot guy. You're not throwing into Rudy Gobert and he's getting 20, 20 and 15. You know what I'm saying? On a consistent basis. That's not his game. Be done, but DeAndre Ayton, as you said, he can take you inside and his stuff, his stuff. All the extends all the way out to three point range. He has a three point, so he's a whole different type of animal and a dynamic that I think is really going to cause the uh, the I was about to say Cowboys the Mavs problems. So Jason Kidd has really got to figure that out and how they're going to really counteract him. Let's see if he hits his three. No. <laughs> yeah, well they've cut it to five, so they're at least doing something now. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they they are absolutely. I, I don't this is essentially must win, right? Like right. I, I said before this series started, if they were going to be able to make this a long series and have a shot, they had to take two of the first three. I was really banking on them getting game one. So mm-hmm. we'll see what they're able to do with that. But it's going to be an interesting challenge for this team because you know they got the monkey off their back and they even kind of acknowledged there was a monkey on their back because of not getting out of the first round for 11 years. Right. Luca's not wired this way to be kind of fat and happy with that. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering how the rest of the guys are now. If it's like, oh, okay, we did that. And now it's like we're playing with house money. It doesn't really matter. And right. that can be good and bad, right? Like you can play a little loose and reckless, but at the same time, if shit starts going sideways, you don't necessarily say like, all right, we, we got to focus up. You're kind of just like, eh. <laughs> we ain't supposed to be here anyway. So, yeah. you know, that's the mentality. Yeah, it's easy to go to that mentality, as you said before. Because it's been 11 years since they got past that first round. So it's almost like, ah, you can breathe. You don't have to deal with that pressure in the media and saying, oh, here we go again. So, but that, that uh, complacency can come in because as you said before, you got to the next round, nobody expects you to be in this round. So if you start getting blown out, it's easy to say, well, we weren't supposed to be here anyway. So let's try to get, you know what I mean? It, Mm -hmm. It gets easier for you to accept if I want to say that word, except the loss is right. real uh, because you said that we really shouldn't be here. And Phoenix, they played for the NBA championship last year. So right. anything we're getting is gravy. You know what I mean? That could be the mentality. We hope that's not the mentality, but that could, could happen. Yeah, I think I do think that this is a, a generally scrappy bunch. So we'll we'll see what they're able to do i mean they are overmatched here it's going to really be a big test for the coaching staff but until we know more (laughs) we're kind of stuck in limbo at this point on the mavericks front but we do have some cowboys to talk here the nfl draft went down i know you followed that way more closely than i did this year especially uh let's let's talk cowboy draft grades how are we feeling about this, first of all? Like, if we, if we had to just give a general impression, how are you feeling about it? Initially, I'm going to – I was saying like a low B. Um, yeah. And it's like that low B range just initially as I look at it uh, from afar because you do have some unknowns in the draft. I mean, you got Tyler Smith in the first round. Obviously, he has good talent. I mean, a lot of publications, you know, said he had the ability, first round talent ability, but he just had a lot of things to clean up with his feet, with his hands, just a lot of those things that need to be cleaned up. Um, so it's still a question mark. Yep. Um, and he played at Tulsa. So you you worry about competition as well. Um, so There's a question mark right there. Sam Williams, a lot of people liked him, but he became a higher draft pick after he ran the 4-4 in the 40 at the Combine. A lot of publications, including myself, was saying more fourth round, but I picked him in the second round DDP on my mock draft because I kind of did it how probably the Cowboys were. Maybe let's draft him now 
because he won't last to the third round. So let's go ahead and get him now. And then, um, you know, you just look at a few of the other picks. Uh, I like Jake Ferguson. I had him in multiple mocks, but obviously he doesn't have the speed that I like. I wish I would, we could have got a faster tight end, but he all fits the mode of the Jason Witten type of mm-hmm. tight end that they never seem to want to move away from. So yeah. he kind of fits that mode. So he has a good player. I wish we just could move out of there and try to get some speed to that position. So, you know, um, and then you got the Matt, um, oh gosh, what's his last name? Well, that while let's, well, let's go. I think it's Matt. Mm. Well, let's go. Yeah. You know, he's not coming from a big school either. Six foot eight, a little bit, you know, small down low, but you know, mm-hmm. strong up top. So you have question marks throughout the play, the um, draft DDP, but it's good. Very good talent. If that talent comes together, you don't feel as bad. But I think one of the steals to me was Jalen Tolbert in the third round. Yeah. I really love that value pick. I thought teams would probably get him a little higher, mm-hmm. maybe possibly second round. And so when the Cowboys didn't get a receiver early, I thought this is a guy that they could definitely target. And I thought for the third round, for what he's going to really bring to the table, I thought that was a great pick um, for them right there. Yeah, the the general impression that I, I took away, and again, I, I didn't do a whole lot of researching on the prospects before this draft, mm-hmm. um, but the the general kind of takeaway and everything as I've been getting caught up seems to be that early on they were reaching a little bit. Like they these guys were higher ceiling, but mm-hmm. the general consensus had the Cowboys, the Cowboys are higher on them than some of these other uh, teams and everything. So like you mentioned from Tulsa, that uh that's a very high ceiling player potentially but it's also a guy with one of the lower floors uh as as far as like the that position so i i don't know how much i love that (laughs) because i always think like yeah the ceiling is great but not a lot of guys actually reach their ceiling and when you're taking a first round pick you kind of want to be as sure as you can like it's a crapshoot once you get past the first few rounds, especially, but the first round pick, you're almost looking for like every year almost needs to be like a, all right, we need to hit on this. And this needs to be a a good consistent contributor to our team for the next few years, at least the rookie contract. Right. And that's why if you hit or you miss a couple of years in a row, you start talking about like, Oh man, what are we doing with the draft? Are we, you know, are we losing our touch a little bit here? Are we off lately? Like you need to hit on this and Maybe he can reach that level. I don't know if he's your Tyron Smith replacement, but uh, that's kind of uh, what they seem to be going for. I did like uh, the receiver in the third round as well. I, I thought that was great value there to get him. And that's a guy that can certainly contribute to this receiving core that now needs help. So uh, it seemed like late as well. They rallied strong like some of the guys they were picking up in the later rounds and again those aren't guys with huge expectations but the the caliber of guys they were getting for where they were getting them was high value so maybe one or two of those hits and you get a couple other decent contributors but yeah it's it's interesting i don't know that i love the draft i think you i think your grade was pretty spot on um i i'm kind of lukewarm on it from everything i've heard and read so far yeah, well, like I said, there, it's one of those. It to me, it's not like a guaranteed draft. It's a, it's question marks, but there's talent. So you're hoping that when the talent that you see, because take for example, that fifth round, we mm-hmm. had Dallas had four picks in the fifth round. Um, you know, Deron Blam, I hadn't really known nothing about him, but I didn't really study corners. You know, he has the length that uh, Dan Quinn likes. He's yeah. those he's six two. He's two hundred pounds. He's got the long arms. He, you know, that's what Dan Quinn likes. But is he going to make the roster? Is he really going to play? You got guys, a lot of guys ahead of him. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's a question mark. Uh, Damone Clark loved the talent. He played with uh, Jabril Cox. They were a nice little uh, mm-hmm. package back in, you know, at LSU. And he had over 100 tackles this past season. He looked really good in the senior bowl. Then they found out about this, um, you know, the neck issue. Yeah. Love the talent, but I'm sorry. That's a neck. That's a spinal neck. You're a linebacker. We, we talked about that with LVE. Yep. Uh, so it's a concerning thing. Um, it's saying that 
oh, he may be, he, they're saying that he could be ready uh, mid season, but that's a, a educated guess. So, you know, that's a red, it could be a red shirt year. So if he comes back healthy, you're feeling really good, but that's still a big if, and it's a gamble. So you, that's a question mark by that. You know what I mean? No, hundred uh, percent. I love John Ridgeway. That was one of my guys I picked. Uh, actually, I had Brandon Tucker who trained him, um, and the QB hunters, um, and the trench warfare. And he, he caught, they were calling him. Well, obviously we were calling him the vanilla gorilla. I think I love that name. They were calling his name in the chat when they drafted him. And then we said it on Twitter, you know, I, I posted, you know, and I tagged him. Like, I don't like to tag players, but I tagged sure. him like, Hey man, you know, a lot of people calling you the vanilla gorilla. And I kind of like that name. You feel me? Right. And, um, uh, they, they rolling with it in, you know, did you see where they had it in the newspaper in uh, the Arkansas newspaper? They were calling the vanilla gorilla that's already. Funny. And funny. I was like, wow, that's very quick. So, uh, but he offers a lot DDP as far as the size, six foot five, 335 pounds. Um, he's a true zero one tech and you got Bohanna coming back. So you look at, man, there's potential DDP, but you don't know because right. Bo Bohanna still, he didn't really get the, the tick as a rookie. So he's still an unknown. They're hoping for the trajectory. I mean, you're hoping for John Ridgeway to come in and be that uh, help at the uh, middle because we know that the middle has always been an issue in Dallas for a very long time. So it's a lot of question marks. So from the talent perspective of where you got these guys, you're like, that's why you would grade the draft how you would. But there's still a lot of question marks with it um, throughout it. Just, just the fact. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, they address some needs for sure. And you kind of see like some of the guys where in certain spots, they looked like they were looking more at, all right, well, what's his potential versus his immediate necessary impact. I get that. I understand the thinking, but I definitely want to see, uh, I, I want to see urgency, I guess, from this team. And I just don't sense that. Like, I still don't sense that in free agency. They've been completely mute, more or less, not, not really pressing like so many of these other teams. Like you see these teams that already achieved more than them. I mean, hell, the Rams. And they're actually like continuing to retool and load up. And you look at Dallas and it just seems like, all right, well, we got another draft class coming in. That's kind of, eh, we'll see what they turn out to be, but we're not going to get crazy in free agency. In fact, we're going to trade some of our guys or cut some of our guys, like some of our guys that are in the top five, 10 best players we got. And I don't know. That, that's that been my hardest thing to kind of reconcile since the season ended is this felt like a team from a talent perspective that was there. And I just don't understand the lack of urgency for a team that should be pressing to try and get over that hump finally. Well, I mean, DDP, that's what I've been screaming this whole time. And I don't even be wanting to scream it no more. Uh, you hit that, like you said, uh, the nail on the head. That's what I've been talking about. There is no sense of urgency. When I listen to the Joneses, particularly Stephen Jones, all I hear him is telling the fans, be patient. But Dallas has been patient. 20-something years been patient. He's saying, I understand that, you know, Dallas has fall short, but you got to be patient with us, man. They've been patient. But see, as I said before, DDP, there's nobody in that front office pushing the Joneses. Nobody's no. pushing Jerry. Nobody's pushing Steven. They run the whole thing. Charlotte, Jerry Jones Jr. is all, it's nothing but them on the board and throughout. So there's nobody sitting there saying, Hey man, we got to get this going because there's nobody telling Jerry nothing. There's nobody telling Steven nothing except Jerry. So um, they can take their time if they want to, because at the end of the day, as I said before, they're not losing money right now. No. They're still one of the highest grossing NFL, the whole franchise in sports. Yeah. So let's keep it real. Like, you say sense of urgency, not saying you, I'm saying we say sense mm -hmm. of urgency, but when your team is still the number one franchise money-wise, right? where would there be the sense of urgency for real, especially from these guys? And these guys swear they're football guys. They're not football guys. They're good businessmen, but they're not football guys. And the problem is they got Will McClay doing it, but they're just taking their time. And they're just like, like as you said, you got another draft class. Let's see what happens. Let's see how this pans out. We right. had a good team from last year. We still got talent. But the thing that keeps coming back to me is 
Dallas has not shown they can ever win in adversity no. since uh, for how long? So with everything that's happened in this offseason, DDP, when you had uh, the thing that happened with Kevin Joseph, you had the issue with your coach um, and then Sean Payton. And then we just had the off-field controversy with the Joneses in general. Mm-hmm. How would it make me think that with all this that's going on and Dallas hasn't did anything to show they, they can rise above adversity, that they're going to be able to do it this year with all this stuff going on? I'm sorry. And, and you lost yeah. players and you didn't really add players that you lost. Yes, you're not killing yourself, but you lost Amari Cooper, Randy Gregory. You lost talent. The talent you brought in is not matching talent you lost, and you're mm-hmm. hoping on the draft, and there are question marks. So, once again, you're hoping that it's going to happen, and I just don't like that feeling. I feel like he, they're just setting up the people once again uh, for some issues down the line that we really don't want to talk about. Yeah. I was five years old the last time the Cowboys won the Super Bowl. So in my like actual paying attention to sports, I, I haven't seen it. And so like an off season like this feels like death by a thousand cuts. And then something like the Amari Cooper trade, especially for the value they got for him, which is to say nothing, uh, kind of feels like lopping off a hand after, you know, a thousand of those cuts. <laughs> like uh, it, it's, it's brutal. So I don't know that that's been the, the thing for me. That's kind of taken me out of it. And yeah, they might be the the number one sports franchise in the world in terms of brand value and worth and all of that over what, five or 7 billion, whatever crazy value. And it's like, that's great. But like a lot of that is just the showmanship and caricature of Jerry Jones when he's not here anymore. That's not going to be there. Like you're not going to have that thing where you can just be mediocrity incarnate for however many years and keep growing in value or let alone holding the same value. Like if you got uh, Steven or Charlotte or whoever running things, it's going to decrease in value like that. I don't know if it's going to be enough for them to even really care that much or show any urgency beyond this. But my point is it, it feels like a, there's a ticking clock on that and should just be an added sense of urgency if for no other reason than Jerry wants to win one more before he dies. And you don't see it. You don't see it. You don't sense it. And it feels like they're just stuck in the middle where they've been for a quarter century. And I'm just like, all right, well, if you don't care, why should I care? I feel you. I mean, that's where I'm at DDP. But like I said, you know, when I'm doing my shows and my channel, I try to keep some positive, but sure. I got to keep it real. Um, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer, uh, but I'm sorry. I don't believe what this squad is saying. Yeah. I don't believe what they're telling me. I don't believe the things that they're saying or anything. I, I mean, even when, you know, when they draft players, I mean, I'm on, I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I'm not excited about this draft DDP. I mean, I'm, I'm where I'm at right now with the Cowboys is this. Last year, I was really heavily on. We'll see. Mm-hmm. They got Dan Quinn. Uh, you know, you you wanted to see what happened after 2020. And I love I love defense. So I love the way he brought that defense together. And I really thought the Cowboys had a Super Bowl team last year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and for the way, I'm sorry to keep going back to it, but the way they lost, yeah. and how they lost to it, it's still like a nasty taste in my mouth. Yeah. Um, and it's not leaving. <laughs> you know, it yeah. hasn't left. It's still there. And um, I just don't know where they kind of rise above that. Once again, they've never shown that they've been able to rise, rise above adversity. So what let me think that after a 25 season of another failure, disappointment, all of a sudden they're going to rise next this year and do go go to a championship or contend for a Super Bowl. No, I feel it's fool's gold. I just feel right. like, like you said, they're just a talented, underachieving franchise organization um, that's getting money. And as yep. long as that continues to go and the money does not lose, then there's not going to be that sense of urgency, DDP. And I feel like this is what Dallas Cowboys are just going to have to deal with for a long time. And really, the only way the Dallas Cowboys are going to win a Super Bowl is if the players play above the coaching, above mm-hmm. the organization. That's the only way these Cowboys are going to win a Super Bowl. Like, Dak is going to have to have a miracle-type year. Uh, right. The defense is going to have to have another mir- uh, ridiculous season like they had last year. 
And how many times do defenses do that year in and year out, DDP? It's hard to replicate. Trevin Diggs is not getting 11 interceptions again every single year. No. You see what I'm saying? So that's where the dynamic you you worry about because what you had last year with the turn uh, the turnovers, the takeaways, you were like tops. You had did things you hadn't done in a franchise in a very long time. Right. It's very hard for me to see that you're going to replicate that with all the controversy went on. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, 100%, 100%. The last bit of optimism I think I had for this team at the start of the offseason when they discovered they were going to be able to retain uh, Dan Quinn. When he was coming back, I was like, okay, that's huge. And then everything that followed it for me, like, and, and again, I'm not trying to be overly negative Debbie Downer, like you said, that's just, that's the feeling I had. Like the last little bit of like, okay, I can at least buy into this a little longer. And then it's like, then we started seeing all the other moves and it's just like, all right, I take it back. <laughs> I, I take it back. I, I can't, man. I can't. It's, uh, it's tough. It, it's very tough trying to, to want this team to get out of its own way in spite of themselves. So we'll just have to see, maybe they, maybe they know what they're talking about. McClay's obviously got a good track record with the draft. So maybe some of these guys, some of these reaches they had as far as taking guys in earlier rounds than they really wanted to, uh, but they wanted to make sure they got them. Maybe some of them elevate their games and kind of make them look smart. You know, they lucked yeah. into Dak Prescott. <laughs> Sometimes it just takes a little bit of luck. But you so, know what? Dak's got to get better. And I've been saying this yep. and, uh, you know, you know, I, we had our final word yesterday and <laughs> the fellows were kind of maybe bugging out on me, but I said, man, I, you know, six years in seven years, uh, you know, Dak to me is still doing kind of the same things he's been doing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know what? I felt like he's reached his, you know, when you talk about players have a ceiling, mm -hmm. I feel like Dak has reached his ceiling. And I feel like he's got to eliminate those things that he's been doing from 2016. And until he eliminates those little things of, you know, not being cautious and letting the ball go and, and, and you know, uh, those those little things, I think that's also going to be a reason why maybe the, the Cowboys don't take that next step. He's got to take that next step. He did it a few years ago. They wanted to see what, you know, can Dak throw the ball, can Dak do this, and he showed he could. But he's yeah. got to take another step right now um, because it's year six, year seven, and uh, you're paid like a franchise type guy, top five pay guy. You got to bring these games home. And when all else fails around you, they're going to look to you being the franchise guy to win those games. And he's got to be able to do it. hundred percent. Especially now, <laughs> more than ever now. So mm -hmm. yeah, we'll find on, out, man. Yeah. We'll find out how good he is. Cause we know what his QBR was before Cooper and after. So now that he's mm -hmm. got to have life without Cooper again, we'll find out pretty quick. Uh, maybe yeah. CD elevates himself. I think CD is certainly capable of it. Uh, I've been incredibly high on CD. Like even before he ended up in Dallas, I was convinced he was going to be a multi-time pro bowler mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he got one last year. So we'll see, we'll see what he's able to do with that. Maybe he elevates his game. Maybe the Cowboys make some adjustments with their scheme to actually try and get the best receiver, the ball more often, you know, funnel it to him. Find ways to get him the ball. Don't just say, well, he's the number one person we'll look to on a route, but up, oh, no, not there. All right. And then let teams scheme your best receiver away. That's madness. But uh, we'll see what they do. Dak's going to have to step up. The whole team's going to have to step up. And I don't know. I don't know how optimistic I am. I don't even care that they have the second or they have, they're tied for the weakest schedule next year. Right. That doesn't move the needle for me at all. Like exactly. If anything, it just makes me think they will be fool's gold even more if they make a run. Totally like if they, agree. If they win the NFC East. I'll just be like, okay, cool. So they're untested then. Yep. Exactly. So. I totally agree with that. Not just, you know, uh, I seen where it was, that was posted and I said, man, I don't care about them having the easiest schedule uh, because that doesn't mean anything to me because Dallas hasn't proved they proven anything with anything. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, they've proven that they fail and they're underachieved. So them having an easy schedule to me, like you said, shows that what that's going to happen is they're going to beat up a whole bunch of weak teams that they mm -hmm. have been doing for the last few years, beating up weak teams. And when they come to a, against a good team, they lose. Isn't yep. that alarming? 
I mean, no matter what we try to run away from or try to spin it different ways, they beat mediocre teams. They mm-hmm. don't beat dominant teams. And when they t- come against a good team, they lose a lot of times. So, um, you know, this is not something that's fake. It's something that's really going on. And that, to me, is indicative of, you know, fool's gold. It's been fool's gold for many years. And I'm be honest with you. I- I'm allowed to say it. Uh, I'm not optimistic about the Cowboys this year. Uh, I just don't think they're going to have a, a good year. I think they're going to regress. And I feel like, uh, you know, all the stuff that they're trying to pump in the media, that they're going to be better than they were last year is just a yeah, lie. And they're going to see um, that it, it's, it's not going to – I just don't feel like it's going to be a great year. Um, that's just what I feel about the team. I don't have a good feeling about the team as a whole. Yeah, no, I agree. So before we wrap this up here, I got a uh, three – cool stats here i guess i could have used them earlier when we were talking more basketball stuff but uh check this out so luca has played tonight is his 18th career playoff game obviously i'm not going to count that because the game's in progress it's early second quarter and mavericks are actually only down four down four points yep so good close to the first quarter but uh in 17 career playoff games luca is tied with michael jordan um, or excuse me, let me, let me clarify this, that. So he reached 500 career points in the playoffs in 16 games. Michael Jordan accomplished the feat fastest in 14 games for the jazz series. He averaged 29 points per game, 10.7 boards and 5.7 assists on 46.9% from the field and 36.7% from three. And the key to me, 80% at the free throw line. I think the last two years in the playoffs, he's been like 54, 56%. He's been brutal. That's huge for him to actually make big time free throws in the playoffs. Um, here's another stat too, talking about how he, the total points he creates. So his 45 points and eight assists in game one gave him a, gives him now a combined average in the playoffs, all, all told the points scored mixed with the assists uh, points per game average. Uh, of 51.4 points per game in his playoff career. That moves him ahead of Wilt Chamberlain for the most in NBA playoff history. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy, dog. Yeah, so you you basically are the fastest player to 500 uh, playoff career points since Michael Jordan. Uh, you've stepped up and addressed a major hole in your game. Now, granted, uh, he played three games in the first round series, but still... from the stripe is huge for him, especially. And then, yeah, his career average in the playoffs at that point, total points generated over 51 per game. That's, that's obscene. That is ridiculous for a a point guard. So, uh, well, you know, he's not the average point guard because, you know, he's six foot seven, 230 some pounds. So he ain't the normal point guard that you're dealing with. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, right. But just to watch his uh, game, this, this short period of a time this dude is going to go down like you said you named him luca legends man and um you know it's been nothing but a legendary career so far and uh man by the time he retires bro he he gonna yeah. probably be like uh the Le- lebron was if he pays like a 20-year career having all the major categories and um you know he's an international player right um that's that's huge Oh, yeah, Uh, because, uh, you know, we've seen what Dirk did Mm -hmm. and he was, you know, in a class by himself and to see how Luca came right behind him and uh, is doing his thing is nothing short but of amazing watching his career so far. It's amazing to me how people are already trying to write the narrative. First, it was that he would that he couldn't get out of the first round. He had two attempts and he was the lesser seed in both matchups and he balled out in both matchups, averaging like 34 points per game total like both series. And then he won a playoff series this year, but they lost game one to the Suns by seven. Then the narrative quickly turned to, oh, it's hollow points. It's empty points. He had 36 points when the game was still close. Even if people want to try and say like, oh, garbage points. All right, so what, like six points maybe? Like, what are you talking about? Like, it's weird. There's a weird backlash effect to it. And I think it's because people hear how great he is. And admittedly, Luca has... uh, temperamental things that rub fans the wrong way right he's got a swagger and an arrogance about him yep, and certain yep. things and that just irks guys dirk never dirk could do that but it wasn't his like 
MO. It wasn't hardwired into him. If anything, you wanted Dirk to be a little more vocal and in your face because he came That's part of what fueled the accusations of him being soft. Luca doesn't do that. Luca will show up anybody. He'll attack you and he'll practically laugh as he pulls down your pants and splashes a three in your eye. He does not mm -hmm. care. And mm -hmm. so for a lot of fans around the league, that just irritates him and makes him dislike him. I get that. But at the same time, the weird way that people try to write off a 23-year-old who's doing obscene things that weren't even fathomable until he started doing them now. And people are trying to like write his narrative off as if his legacy is like on the line or as if it's not that impressive or whatever. He's hollow numbers, whatever. It, it's it's just laughable, you know? Like it, it's one of those weird things where it's like, can we just take a moment to kind of appreciate what we're seeing? Cause you're not going to see many guys like this ever. It, I mean, mm. you, you haven't really seen one yet. Not like this. No, no, <laughs> but, but that will do it for our time here. Thank you everybody for tuning in to episode two of positively relentless. We will be back next week, probably Wednesday again. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit more. We'll see what we got Cowboys wise there. We'll have maybe some other stuff going on. There's always something. This has been an off season where there's always something with them. And that's the way Jerry likes it. Good or right. bad. Right. So we'll have something there. And of course we'll have more Mavs playoff developments. Um, by that point, we'll be a couple more games in the series probably. And so we'll have a good overview of what we're looking at, but thank you for watching. If you haven't already, like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, to Big Game James. And uh, I don't have an outro tag, so I'm just going to remind everyone this is the best Dallas sports podcast. Take our word for it. Till next time, guys. Peace. Peace.